this is a, a subject that, that I really like a lot and actually has sort of been mulling for several years kind of offering to talk a little bit about, uh, about family systems. And if you kind of look at the, uh, the subtitle here, uh, for those who can, who are close enough to see, um, the subtitle is, why is it sometimes difficult for people to change? And family systems has a lot of, um, has a lot to say about that. I fell into uh, to family systems or started learning about family systems in my graduate program. And for me, it was a real easy um, kind of uh, uh, conceptual uh, frame of reference or mindset to take on because with my undergraduate training being in the hard sciences and having studied systems not necessarily from a perspective of systems theory, but having studied so many systems, uh, different biological systems, ecosystems, solar systems. Um, there's so many systems that we study in the hard sciences that this just really felt very natural to me to start um, thinking about, uh, about family systems. So I just sort of glommed on to this in my graduate program and pretty much read everything I could I could get my hands on about it, um, and was was pretty fascinated. Enjoyed everything uh, everything that I learned about it. Um, but here here's some things to think about. Why why are we talking about family systems in student ministry when we don't deal with families, right? We don't work with families. We work with individual care receivers, right? Who have so, families. pardon me. Who have families? Most of them. Educational boy raised in the wild by wolves we work with. But for the most part, most people we work with have families. They come from families, they have their own families, and um, to sort of give away the punchline, um, there you go. <laughs> Bill, nice. What did you say? Bill said, families are the root that cause of all our problems. <laughs> And as you see at the bottom of the, the first slide here, difficulties that your care receiver, that your care receiver is having, may actually be rooted in family systems issues. And we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna try to touch on this with enough to at least sort of whet the appetite. But just some things to, to kind of consider is, does your care receiver seem to have an inordinate amount of difficulty making changes that seem to you like, these are no-brainers. This is easy. This should, you know, we've talked about this week in, week out for five months, six months, 18 months, you know, and you're kind of dealing with the same, same issues. You know, maybe that's indicative that there's something else going on in this person's life that's influencing them. Are the problems in your care receiver's life centered around social interactions. If so, there may be a family root to that. Um, you know, we're, there, there's always sort of the, um, the, the Freudian joke or reference that people make where, you know, somebody's having an issue, it's, it has something to do with their mother, right? The way they were raised, they've got mommy issues, they've got daddy issues. Well, I don't really think about that so much as I think that a lot of this stuff has to do with the way they were raised in families. And what we're going to talk about is, uh, is the, the assigned roles, the assigned and accepted roles that, that people took on in their families. Is it important for your care receiver to have a strong support system to live a vital, happy life? And do they not have that system? Why is that? Um, are your care receiver's issues centered around communication problems? Are they passive aggressive? Do they, um, do, do they have trouble speaking to what they need, to what they want? Do they have trouble um, refusing to take on expectations, maintaining boundaries around expectations? A lot of those kinds of things have roots in, um, in their family. And is there a history of maladaptive behavior? in your care receiver that might point to patterns that you can that you can see in their, their family. So those are all kinds of 
indicators that suggest, hey, maybe there's something more going on with my care receiver that would be valuable for us to kind of talk about about their family. You know, tell me, tell me about what it was like growing up in your family. You know, tell me what it was like for your your mom and her family that she grew up in. Tell me about what it was like for your dad and his family. So, um, so that that's some uh, that's just some discussion about why talking about families and family systems makes sense from a Stephen Ministry perspective. This is not suggesting that any of you become family therapists in your relationship with your care receiver because that's outside the bounds of Stephen Ministry. But it's just some things to to sort of um, touch base on that that you can kind of think about. Our discussion tonight is going to be largely taken from the work of two family systems theory giants. Uh, Murray Bowen, who is a psychiatrist, and Virginia Satir, who is a, this amazing um, therapist that just did this incredible stuff um, with, with her, her families. And in fact, the, the uh, acting that we're going to do um, at, the end of the, <clears throat> at the end of the presentation is like something that, uh, that Virginia Satir would, uh, would do. Um, I'm looking for two more volunteers to, to work with Carol, by the way. Have I mentioned that? <laughs> no volunteers yet. All right. Um, so uh, Murray Bowen did some incredible groundbreaking work on the concept of emotional enmeshment. And he spends a lot of time in his theories talking about families that are emotionally enmeshed. Another way to think about it is that they're sort of an emotional mosh pit for those of you who grew up in kind of the punk rock era and went to, to uh, those uh, concerts and jumped off stage, and, you know, an emotional mosh pit. It's like everybody, uh, it's like everybody is connected by the same emotional umbilical cord. And Bowen did a lot of work on uh, sort of defining what that process of enmeshment was like and the process of becoming differentiated from that family system and taking on an identity on your own. Satir came at it from a little bit uh, different perspective where she really emphasized self-worth, self-esteem, communication <coughs> within, the, within the family, roles within the family. And both of them have real interesting stuff to say about how families work and that conversely how you work with families to bring about change in, in the families. So to, um, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in sort of the wonkiness of this, which is real easy for me to do because it's, it's, it really is pretty fascinating. But if you, um, to, to sort of give you the foundation for where family systems theory comes from, it's, it, it, the, the basics really are pretty simple. With, with, it starts with this notion that um, with systems theory sort of um, bringing together many, many disciplines from virtually every arm of, uh, of science, uh, mathematics, engineering, um, and, and just kind of this multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, contribution to identifying and looking at different systems. And systems being, um, you can define as cohesive groups of interrelated, interdependent parts. If you think about a family, and think about each family member as a part. Clearly in families, we're interrelated, we're, we're interdependent. And that goes for whether they're, they're natural or, or human-made. And what systems theory focuses on is defining the structure and the function. And that's kind of an important part for family systems thinking. The, um, so it defines the structure and the function in it, um, of the whole system in addition to each individual person. Sort of traditional psychotherapy, if you will, really looks at just the person, works on just the person. And there are a lot of uh, people who do individual psychotherapy who really won't touch families because they don't understand them. And that's not not on anybody, it's just family systems thinking is a little bit different. And I can tell you from spending a day working with families at the end of the day, you come out feeling really different than what you feel like if you spend the day working with a, with single person clients. 
It's a whole different energy, whole different uh, level of involvement, a whole different level of work. Um, an important part of systems theory is to identify the boundaries. Where does one system start and another system ends? Um, how many of you have seen the, the incredible pictures that came from the web telescope this, this week? Unbelievable stuff. See how many systems are out there? You know, and you think about, think about our solar system. It's a real easy way to conceptualize what is a system and how interrelated are the parts. Pull one planet out of our solar system and what happens? Collapse. Yeah, take Venus out of the solar system, what happens? Take Jupiter out, take Neptune out, what happens? The whole thing changes, and that's what system theory is all about, okay? Um, <clears throat> a key goal of systems theory is to be able to create models for understanding how systems work, and by doing that, how you can change or impact the system to create change. Okay, so that's, just, that's kind of general systems theory. It's used in a lot of different disciplines. It incorporates a lot of different disciplines. So then if we look at family systems theory, family systems theory takes the general systems theory and applies it to one very specific system, which is the family. And of course, there are a lot of different ways to define families, right? And um, so in essence, you apply it to whatever the people involved define as their family. And then you can you can define what their boundaries are. You can define who those members are, what their what their function is and why why they're together. Um, Murray Bowen in his work emphasizes emphasizes that the family system is really a social system. And he kind of puts it in that perspective to sort of demystify it a little bit kind of give us something we can uh, we can get our hands around. Another interesting observation he makes about it is that within the family system, members interact in such a way to influence the behavior of other members. None of you have ever tried that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Think about that for a second. He just defines it as it's a complex model where the members are interacting specifically to try to influence behavior. Interesting concept. Um, and a word I love, the general psychobiological goal of families basically is to produce more people, right? That can theoretically lead the family, go out, support themselves, take care of themselves, and create more families. That's basically what the family system is designed to do. That's the basic function of it. Interestingly, a lot of families try to make the family be something else. <laughs> they try to have these, these other kinds of things that the family is designed for. But if you peel it back to its most bi basic biological level, that's what, it, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> and then I think an important, um, an important notion for our discussion and for our thinking is that the influence of the family doesn't stop once the kids are eight, turn 18. It's not like, hey, you're 18, sign up for the draft, you can, you can vote, you can buy a gun, you know, you can join the army, wait a few years, you can buy alcohol, and oh yeah, now you're no longer influenced by the family. That's not how it works. Um, that process of, as Bowen would say, of differentiating from the family goes on for a very long period of time. Some people never completely do it. Some people never completely different, differentiate from that, that family that uh, family of origin system. And they continue to bring that in like a comet dragging a, its tail you know, into their new family system, and then the one after that, the one after that. So that's an important piece to, to keep in mind. Another, uh, another important piece to keep in mind is that, um, that tension, anxiety, discomfort always show up in every system, and especially in family systems. Show me a family that has no tension, no anxiety, no discomfort, and I'll show you a family 
on a lot of heavy medication. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's just part of the deal. And so to a certain extent, when we think about dysfunction and dysfunctional families, we can think about what's the level of anxiety, what's the level of tension, what's the level of discomfort that these people drag around with themselves. In healthy families, tension shows up, stress shows up, anxiety shows up, you deal with it, you move on, and the anxiety sort of returns to a baseline level. Of course, when you have teenagers, <laughs> it, you know, it takes longer. Um, in families where there's a high level of dysfunction, first of all, more stuff sets off that anxiety. More stuff set, increases that level of discomfort. So you kind of look at the frequency, the presence, and then a lot of the, in unhealthy families, a lot of the behavior that goes on um, around them is to, to deal with getting that anxiety down to a baseline level. Okay. Um, another uh, a, a, an interesting uh, phenomenon that um, is defined and used by most family systems thinkers is the emotional triangle. So this is the classic, you know, you and your brother, you and your sister are having a fight, you're having an argument, mom shows up, dad shows up, he started it, you know, and instantly they're trying to they're trying to get mom or dad on their side, right? That's what kids do. Well, unfortunately, it's what a lot of adults do, too. Okay, so, you, so the same kind of emotional triangling is going on when mom says, wait till your dad gets home. Okay, or when dad says, I don't know, go ask your mom. Same thing, it's moving that tension, moving that, that anxiety around. And it's, li it's little pieces like that, little behaviors like that, that, um, that, can, that you can actually measure, you can actually see, you can, you can define it, you can call it what it is. And when you get families together um, in the presence of a therapist who's skilled with that and can sort of uh, just pull out those little pieces and say, hey, I noticed this. And then families start looking at it. And then from that point on, they can't ever not look at it. So um, it shows up in a lot, of uh, a lot of different ways. A lot of times it's very innocuous. A lot of times it's not innocuous. Um, so we talked about uh, differentiation, touched on that. Um, I am going to use tonight, how many of you have watched even one episode of the Netflix series Yellowstone? I'm going to use the Dutton family <laughs> for reference. Okay, some some properties of uh, family systems: concept of wholeness, and for the most part, these are these are um, concepts of general systems theory as well. Concept of wholeness is the whole the system as a whole is greater than the sum of its individual parts. So you've got your you got mom, dad, two point five kids. Okay, those are your those are your four and a half parts. But then they come together and you know there's the, the kids, there's the adults, there's the women in the family, there's the men in the family, there's all these other subsystems, and all of that contributes to what goes on with the system as a whole is more than just the four and a half individual people. Okay? So that's wholeness. Status quo is that state. Where the, the, where the family is sort of settled into, this is the level of tension we'll tolerate. And if it gets more than this, we've got to do these other things, and we're going to talk about what those other things are. We've got to do these other things to get back to that level of tension, that level of anxiety that where we're comfortable. And no more. Just do that, get back to here, and no other changes. Equilibrium is that state where the status quo is, is being constant. Equifinality is a real kind of fun and interesting concept that we won't spend too much time on it. But basically it is, you can get to the same outcome from almost anywhere you start. 
Okay, so if you think about the Dutton family, think about them having dinner in their dining room <laughs> with the oyster spoons and they've never had oysters. What's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. It doesn't matter who sits down first. And eventually, Kevin Costner is going to be sitting there by himself and they have had a big argument. That's what happens. That's the finality. So it doesn't matter what combination of people are there. There's going to be an argument. Probably Beth is going to get up. She's going to be crude. She's going to be rude. She's probably the one who's kicked it all off. And Kevin Costner is going to be sitting there at the head of the table by himself. <laughs> so that's that's echo finality. Okay. Um, homeostasis is the concept of those kinds of dynamics that go on, and this this is probably one of the more important concepts. It, it's the dynamics that go on that nudge the system, or push, or shove, or pull the system back to the status quo when somebody in the system is trying to do something different. Somebody in the system is trying to change. When somebody in the system is trying to grow in a certain way, that creates more anxiety. The homeostatic pressures are gonna start, are gonna go to work to try to pull this person back. Say, no, you need to be right here doing this, not any of this nonsense over here. Okay? We won't spend too much time on, um, on on feedback, but um, boundaries in family systems theory isn't as much about the boundaries the way we kind of think about them in Stephen ministry, but more is the system open or is it closed? And again, this is a really sort of important concept to figure out is this, um, with your care receiver, they're part of one, maybe multiple family systems, how open are those systems to outside information? If, it's, if they have very closed boundaries, and your care receiver is having these ideas about things they want to be different in their life, about things they want to do different, about different roles they want to take on, and they go back into the family and they're talking about this kind of stuff. And somebody says, where did you hear that crap? Well, that's homeostatic pressure, trying to bring it back under control. And don't think that just because you're 18 or 30 or 45 and have two kids of your own or you know whatever age you are and however many kids and grandkids you have that you're immune to that because family system pressures show up all the time um, and the interesting sort of uh, notion about uh, family systems and crises um, and I forget who said this, um, <clears throat> but there was uh, there, there's a, a, a concept that any unresolved crisis in the family will surface every time there's another crisis. So just because, and for the most part, with unhealthy families, they don't want to deal with the issues of the crisis. They just want to get back to, to status quo. Right? But Kevin Costner gets all shot up, get me out of the hospital. <laughs> yeah, I know, I've been shot six times in the chest. What, get me out, let me out of the hospital. They, they just want to get back to the status quo. Um, so, um, why do I go there? Oh, boundaries. Yeah, so um, the more closed that a family system is, the less receptive it's going to be to information coming in from anywhere from outside the system, the more difficult it is for people to change those roles. Because every time they go back for Thanksgiving dinner, I mean, why is it that the, the big joke of the holidays is there's always going to be a family fight at Thanksgiving dinner? Well, it's got to be based on some truth because it gets told enough, right? It's not just a funny thing to say. It's it's a funny thing to realize that there's so many families that get together at, uh, at, at the holidays and they have these fights. Why is that? It's unresolved crisis. It's, un it's those family dynamics trying to, once everybody's face to face, trying to pull them in and massage them back like, 
you know, like Play-Doh back into, here's the mold you're supposed to be in. And we're, we're, we're subject to these, even as adults, these pressures. So um, moving on from, uh, from uh, properties to how, so how are these dynamics expressed? How do we see these things? What do we look at? What, what might, how might they show up in, um, in, in your care, with your care receivers? One is through multi-generational family traits, like career paths, like the Duttons. They, they all become cowboys, right? And if they're, uh, if they're lucky enough, they get a brand on their chest. <laughs> right? What? You want to watch that, don't you? Yeah. That's a big lot. <laughs> Carol's awake. <laughs> relationship patterns. You know, the women in the family all behave this way. The men all behave this way. Except for one. <laughs> One's identified to, to behave a little bit different. Okay? Addiction, abuse, those are all kinds of multi-generational family traits. Um, in addition to the Duttons, I often use my family, and I actually taught, taught family systems, had the, had the um, opportunity to do that for a few years. Uh, I would always use my family of origin as an example because it's just such a juicy group to use. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the things that I learned uh, when I started doing sort of a, a family tree, a multi-generational family tree, not just of who the characters were, where they came from, born, the diet, all that, I dug into the, um, to, to what some of the interesting behavior patterns were. And there were a few things I wanted to kind of keep my eye on. And so bearing in mind that, you know, I'm almost 65 years old, born in the 50s, okay? You didn't know that? <laughs> Carol's like, you're like, man, you're old. <laughs> Well, I think um, you were older. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so kind of keep in mind the times. Um, I, I learned, and it was sort of a, a not well-spoken, but um, kind of understood notion that when my mom got remarried, she was pregnant. Um, what came to light when, when I was um, in high school was that my grandmother, who was the matriarch of the family, I mean, she, was, she was the center of the family um, from sort of an outward perspective. My grandfather was kind of the silent patriarch. He was sort of in charge of everything, but my grandmother ran everything. Well, lo and behold, the son from her first marriage decided he wanted to visit her. He lived in Hawaii, and he decided he wanted to come over to the States and visit her. Well, none of us had ever heard about this guy. In fact, <laughs> none of us had ever heard that she'd been married before. <laughs> in fact, none of us knew that my Aunt Charlotte was not my grandfather's natural daughter. She was from my grandmother's first marriage. She was a white-skinned native uh, Hawaiian girl who married a more native-looking Hawaiian boy. And her, my aunt, Charlotte, would, looked a lot more like my grandmother. And her brother, looked a lot more like my grandmother's first husband. So when they split up, they decided he'd keep the, the son, Charles, and she'd keep Charlotte. And guess what? She was pregnant when she got married. Interesting. So I went back and I started digging and found that you go back two generations before and the mom was married, or was pregnant when they got married. And we're talking about, you know, 1800s and times when that didn't, didn't happen. 
today we we talked we talked about that, and it's just not that it doesn't create the same sort of emotional reaction or <gasps> kind of value that it had then. But man, you talk about some anxiety and stress and tension in the family when all this sort of came out around 1974-75. My grandmother was not a happy lass at that point in time. <laughs> so multi-generational family trees. And doing a, doing a simple family tree like that can re reveal some real interesting stuff. Um, multi-generational multi family stories and myths, especially around heroes and villains in the family. A, that's one way that family system dynamics are expressed. Well, how is that? Well, you are a lot like whoever. As soon as the, those words come out, man, you might as well wear that around your chest. Because with that comes expectations. Or you should be more like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, Stereotype kind of conflict. They, again, the Duttons, those fights they get in into at dinner, it's it's the same thing. You can script it out every time. I know it's Hollywood, it all is all scripted out, but it's a it's a great way to look at that show from a family systems um, perspective. Behavioral problems can be very similar from one generation to another another. Are you trained to fight? And everything becomes a fight? trained to sort of shy away from that? <clears throat> what, what are those, what are some behavioral issues that, that show up? And then of course physical and mental health issues. Oftentimes you can see multi-generational traits in eating disorders and various other kinds of uh, mental health kinds of issues. So the reason to think about this from time to time is that you may see some of these things in your care receiver. And you may be Care receiver may be saying, well, I want to work on this, one want to do this. And again, you know, same thing over and over and over again. And if the care receiver is making plans and talking about how to, uh, um, to, some changes they want to make and they just can't ever seem to pull the, the trigger, maybe there's something more going on. And again, not that you're going to be a family therapist, but sometimes it can be interesting just to say, hmm, I remember when we first started getting together, you were telling me about your mom, and you were telling me about your dad. Tell me more about that. Okay. All right. It's getting to getting close to that time. Have I mentioned I need two more volunteers? <laughs> All right, Rick. You're not the one getting the ground. <laughs> Okay, so we've got one. We need one more. So, um, Virginia Satir, she um, spent a lot of time looking at how do families communicate? How do healthy families communicate? How do unhealthy families communicate? And she sort of narrowed down unhealthy communication patterns to four types of roles in the family. And I'm gonna toggle back and forth on a couple of things here hopefully, if I succeed. So she describes one of those unhealthy roles as the blamer. Never this guy's fault. Always the first guy to say who created the problem, right? Always his fault, or always somebody else's fault. So that's, that's one, one type. One near and dear to my heart, the computer. Looks at everything from a very analytical perspective. <clears throat> Gives off this sense of separation or aloofness from any of that base or unnecessary feeling stuff. Okay. Seems to not be getting involved in the the heat of the, the battles, but really is being just torn up and thrashed about it and doesn't know how to be present. And that's, that's the computer. Then there's, here's the placator, the people pleaser. 
anybody figured out yet what roles we're going to be uh, acting? Okay, this is the person who ju just wants everybody to feel good, just wants everything to calm down, just wants things to go back to that even, that even keel. Whatever you want. Yes, that's fine. Nope. <laughs> and the distractor. <laughs> this is the person who is always going to bring up something else. So you're arguing about something, and this person's going to come in with anybody want dessert? Whatever they can do to get the attention off whatever that issue is. And of course, whatever the whatever that role is, whatever the communication is, whether it's blaming or it's placating or it's the computer or it's distracting, the issue's never being addressed, right? That's where, that, that's how those homeostatic dynamics show up to get the system back to st the status quo. So let's say your care receiver identifies, I've always, been, I've always been this people pleaser. I was always the one in my family to, to try to take care of everybody and get everybody to feel good. Interesting, does that still happen? Some real easy questions that you don't have to answer. They'll answer and they can talk about it and they can sort of figure it out. Okay? And then there's Satir identifies one healthy kind of communication pattern that she calls the leveler. That's the open, honest, direct communicator. So here's what to keep in mind. During times of elevated stress, tension, anxiety, family members will default to whatever their assigned and accepted role is. And you'll see this even when they're not in their family, even when they're not with their family. And so why is your, why is your care receiver having so much trouble changing and being different? Well. Maybe that role was really, really, really ingrained in them, like a tattooed Y on their chest. It's good to get a positive reaction from at least one person. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Any individual family member who tries to change and grow and adopt, adopt improved relationship behaviors will increase the tension in the family. And unless the family, of course, has worked through all this. And so you can see when you're, when you're doing family systems work, you've got the whole family together. And as a therapist, you sort of have permission to kind of poke and tease and prod and pull some of this stuff out. You can see how it can become a pretty lively environment pretty quick. So, just so you know, Carol has agreed to be a distractor. Oh, I can't imagine. Alan, you would be the other person. So, would you pass that back to Carol? Rick said you'd be the flavor. All right, I'm going to be Mr. Computer. Oh. All right, I need one more. I need a plate here. All right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I also need one minute of preparation with our three actors. With our cast. Yes. All right, so we are ready for our performance debuts, okay?
And so we are going to show you what it looks like through a very simple exercise when a family works and when a, a, at a behavior that might not look like something that many families do, um, tuba playing families might, um, Oompa Loompas might. Um, so there's maybe some kinds of families that might do this, but it's a fairly simple be behavior just to sort of illustrate the point. So we're gonna show you what it looks like when the family's working, and then we're gonna show you what it looks like when it doesn't work, and kind of illustrate how that causes roles to, to kick in. Okay? This may be completely silly, may be completely ridiculous, but it's a good good way to illustrate. <laughs> okay, so with that, curtains up, actors up. All right. start to increase and they just had to fall back. As long as we went through it the first time and everybody was doing what they were supposed to do, it was all fine. Everybody was comfortable, looked happy, no problems. As soon as one jerk starts trying to be a little bit different, everybody got to answer you. And that triggers their roles. And that is the end of uh, my prepared remarks. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. So we're talking about family of origins, mm -hmm. but we're also talking about the nuclear family afterwards. Yeah. So they all meld. One person is from different places, so do they fall back? Have you seen where people are, act differently in different family circles? Mm -hmm. They learn different roles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People can learn different roles and take on different roles. Although I think it's more typical that people carry forward the same role. I'll give you an, an example of this. My middle son, um, father of my two uh, beautiful granddaughters, <coughs> his wife, her family of origin, apparently, when they got the families together, her mom's family, her father's family. Apparently there was mass chaos, fighting, weird stuff went on. Mm -hmm. So at some point, her dad, um, who's clearly in control of the, not only the, the, what goes on in the family, but the sort of the emotional um, tone and tenor, um, he said, we're not, dude, we're not ever bringing the families together. Not ever having any of mom's side with my side without mixing me, but we're not doing any of that. Well, before before I ever even met her parents, she decided that that's what they were going to do, what she and Jonathan would do. Never get the two.
two sets of families together. So they've been married now six or seven years. The only time I've gotten together with her parents is at the wedding. Mm -hmm. And she will not have it any other way. Wow. That's a multi-generational trait right there. Wow. Yeah. Have you sat down with her and psychoanalyzed her? Or <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out pretty quick there, the first time I met him. There mm -hmm. <laughs> were a lot, lot of connections between her behavior and his behavior. It was, um, it, it, was, it was systems analysis, it wasn't psychoanalysis. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So when you talked about the triangulation, um, yeah. so is the remedy or whatever for that is to just, or what is the remedy for that? Or, or is there one? Is it always going to be a triangulation? Well, let, um, one of the fun things about uh, family therapy is that you can do a lot of sort of uh, in comedy, they call it physical comedy. You can do physical kind of psychotherapy. So what I would do frequently when I would work with families is when I would see that go on, I would literally pick up my chair if I was talking to sit with you and somebody else was trying to jump in to make something happen, to, to try the tri triangulation maneuver. I'd sit down in front of you like this and be in between the protagonist. <laughs> and I'd talk to you. And often taught to you in such a way that a message is being delivered here. And <clears throat> that, that's usually pretty effective. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not good. <laughs> you can do things like that to give subtle messages, deliver subtle messages along with sort of the spoken messages that um, you know, later you sort of explain what, what you just did. So that they will deal directly with each other yeah. as opposed to, I'm going to tell your father right. when you get home or that type of thing. Yeah, another thing you can do is you can set up, or I would set up chairs. When I would see that go, go on, I would say, all right, Jane, I want you to pretend that this is your mom, you know, this is your son, and I want you to have a conversation among the three of you in a way that avoids this. Like Clint Eastwood's empty chair. <laughs> yes, I'm interested in uh, the family goals you were talking about earlier. Yeah, has anybody ever done any mapping of that against Enneagram numbers? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's been a while since I've really um, studied a lot of family family. Um, systems theory, family therapy, um, <clears throat> and only probably within the last couple of years got introduced to the Enneagram. So I don't know that, but that would probably make for a real interesting uh, Google search. Yeah. Virginia Satir, family roles, and Enneagram. Any other questions? I appreciate you guys uh, being so attentive as I got a little wonky here with this stuff. <laughs> Hopefully it was useful. We're going to put this out on uh, YouTube. If it wasn't useful, tell me that before we put it out on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. 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 Franklin, first, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. All right, guys.